Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 234 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. If we really want to understand the everyday life of early Americans, then we really need to understand the everyday life of early American farms and farmers. Because roughly three quarters of the colonists and settlers in British North America and the early United States considered themselves to be farmers. So how did early Americans establish farms? And what were the rhythms of their daily lives? Richard Bushman, the Governor Morris Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University, joins us to investigate early American farms and farm life with details from his new book, The American Farmer in the 18th Century, A Social and Cultural History. Now, during our agricultural exploration, Richard reveals why early Americans wanted to farm, how colonists and early Americans created and built new farms, and details about the rhythms of work and farm life for early American farm families. But first, I'm coming to Milwaukee. Hello, Wisconsin. On Monday, April 29, we're going to have a meetup at Sefiro's Pizza at 6 p.m. Now, you'll find the details you need for this event at benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. On Tuesday, April 30th, I'll still be in Wisconsin, and I'll be giving a free public program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The program is called Podcasting the Past, an evening with Ben Franklin's World, and I'll be doing this program with Wisconsin NPR. I've placed the details for this event in the show notes. I'm really looking forward to my trip to Wisconsin, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you. Okay, ready to get your hands dirty? Now, we're not actually going to till any fields in this episode, but we are going to explore the work of early American farming. So let's get to it. Our guest is the Governor Morris Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University. He's an award-winning historian whose expertise is in American religious, social, and cultural history. And he's published numerous articles and books, including several books about the history of Mormonism and, most recently, The American Farmer in the 18th Century, a social and cultural history. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Richard Bushman. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, Richard, I wonder if we could start with what attracted you to study farms? Because when I met you years ago, I heard you talk about this project, and you were just so passionate about your work on farming and the day-to-day life of early American farmers. So there must be a backstory here, and I wonder if you would tell us what it is. Well, the strange thing is it doesn't come out of my personal background. None of my family were farmers. You have to go back to my great-grandfather to find a farming. But as an early American historian, I knew full well that three-quarters of the population were farmers. So if you're going to talk about Americans in the early period, you have to deal with farmers. I guess that's true. And sometimes we hear that British North America and the new United States were places made up of farmers. And it sounds like if three quarters of the early American population thought of themselves as farmers, we'd have to talk about it. Right. And on top of the people who called themselves farmers, Almost everyone else tried to get a little land where they could raise food, have a few animals, have some fruit trees. So merchants, ministers, lawyers and doctors, and lots of tradesmen. When they laid out towns, they would often have home lots that would have 10 or 15 acres connected to them so that people could run a small farm operation on the side. Huh. And Where do you think Americans desire to farm, even if they weren't full-time farmers or naturally farmers, where do you think their desire to work the land came from? Everybody wanted to have a little land and have a cow, grow some vegetables, have some fruit trees. It was because this is the way they provided for themselves. There weren't a lot of stores. And you went to the store, you went in debt. You had to pay for it in some way. So these people thought they could save money and avoid going into obligations to the storekeeper if they could make as much as possible for themselves. So when we talk about early British North America and the early United States, 
we're really talking about places where three quarters of the population considered themselves to be farmers. And even if they weren't a full time farmer, they wanted to at least farm part time to cultivate the food and supplies their family needed. So given how into farming Americans really seem to be, how did they go about establishing a farm? Susie would really like to know just how much forest land the British colonists would have had to clear to establish a farm. And Jeremy, he'd like to know how well European farming practices suited North American climates and lands. It was a huge task because most of North America on its east coast is forested. So you don't have great natural open spaces. And cutting down those trees was immensely demanding. Someone once said it costs more to fence property than the property itself. You had to fence property to prevent uh, grazing cattle or wild animals invading your crops. So it's a huge job. But it was something you could do in little pieces. You didn't have to clear land, get all the stumps out before you could plant or get any crops on it. First place, animals can graze in forest areas. So you can just set them free in the woods, put a mark on them so you can identify them, and then round them up when you want them. So that helped a lot. The big problem is getting hay to feed them through the winter. And there were some natural meadows, and the first settlements went to these places where there were no trees, there were just of these dense grasslands, and they could cut that for hay and feed their animals in the winter. But it's a long, hard process. They could take trees down by girdling them, just slicing off a piece of bark all the way around, which would prevent the sap from running to the top. The tree would die. Then they could burn the tree, and they could sell the ashes from burning the tree to the people who were dying Well, the ashes serve as a base of a dye. And so there are various ways to do it. And then farmers would just extend this out. They would take many, many years to clear a farm and their way all through their property. How long did it take a farmer to clear their land? Are we talking about a one-generation type of project, or was this a multi-generational project? Well, it certainly isn't done in one generation because you just have tiny little settlements along the coast, and they would work on enough farm to get them going. But the way they worked, they would get more land than they were actually using. They would get, uh, you know, 100 acres or so, and they would only farm 10 or 15 acres of it. And they would plant crops for a number of years, say eight or 10 years. And then when the soil was exhausted, they would stop planting crops, open up a new area, build fences around it, and start afresh. And the old area would just go back to brush, and for 20 years, just whatever grew would grow there. That would partially restore the fertility, and in time, they could go back and work on it. So this could be multi-generational. It would go on and on, continually opening what they called unimproved land. You noted that farmers often purchase more land than they ever intended to farm, and When we think about purchasing land today, we typically go out and visit the property that we want to purchase. We go out and see the land for ourselves. And I wonder, is this how the 18th century American farmer purchased their land? Yeah, they liked to see the land before. But of course, in the 18th century, the land is not just right next door in an adjoining town. They're having to travel, you know, 100 or 200 miles to the area where the uh, property is. And sometimes, you know, it's just too hard to go out there. So they would go a lot on news. They're always listening. Where is the good land? You know, a lot of gossip would come back from the frontier and then they would uh, take a chance. Or there would be land speculators who would be developing this land. They would come back and say, look, I've got beautiful property out there. Come on out buy some of my land, I'll give you a good deal on it. And so they would sort of take their chances. It was a chancy business when you had to go a long ways to get to the property you wanted to sell. Okay, so after a farmer acquired their property and cleared enough land to grow some crops, what was their day-to-day life like as an 18th century farmer? Well, we have, I think, a mistaken view of farmers. We're aware of the everyday 
routines. You got to go out, feed the animals, milk the cows, hoe the garden. And we think of it as sort of a, a rhythmic life. But when you look at the diaries that farmers kept, it's a life that's different every day. In the first place, you don't know what you're going to do that day until you wake up and see the weather. The weather makes all the difference in the world, whether you can work in the fields or are they too wet and muddy. Is there snow on the ground? As soon as there's enough snow on the ground, then you start hauling wood. There are certain things during the year you have to do. You have to plant corn. You have to cut hay. You have to harvest the corn and slaughter the animals. And these would come rhythmically through the year. But on any given day, the farmer has to make a lot of decisions about where he's going to go on top of kind of a under rhythm of feeding the animals and milking the cows and so on. But mainly it's a choice every day. You have to develop a new work agenda every day of your life. You know, speaking of these varied work agendas, it was really interesting to me as I read your book, The American Farmer in the 18th Century, that farmers didn't just farm. I remember you talked about Matthew Patton, and I remember Patton because Patton was a farmer in the same town I grew up in, Bedford, New Hampshire. And you noted that Patton didn't just farm, that he also took on a lot of carpentry work. And you also noted how several other farmers in your book had the same type of outlook. They farmed and they also performed some sort of trade or skill on the side. So I wonder if you would tell us why farmers like Matthew Patton had side hustles, if you will, or businesses on the side that they performed along with their farm work. and. How a farmer like Patton would have chosen what kind of trade or skill that they wanted to perform on the side? Well, it becomes very difficult to know what is the side business. You know, we think farmers today having one major crop or two major crops, they grow those and they sell them. And then they have maybe a little side business. They have a roadside stand or they have a equipment dealership or something like that. But in those days, you have this domestic economy that's providing food. But then after that, you just do what you can. One eminent farmer in Connecticut would build ships. Matthew Patton collected pelts, raccoon pelts, and what he called sable pelts. We would call them martens or fox pelts and collect you know, a couple of dozen pelts and then sell them in Boston. He was a trapper. and then. At other times, he would make window sashes. He was sort of a carpenter on the side. So people were always devising some little skill. I can become a tanner. And that isn't your whole life because you're running a farm on the side, but it's something you can do to sort of fit into the local economy. So they have to be very alert and very quick to take advantage of the little opportunities that come along. That's a really good point that all of these farmers have to negotiate and live within the economies around them. So I wonder if you could speak more about the different economies that farmers had to negotiate, because I happen to see the economy of the big Atlantic marketplace, as well as the one that you mentioned, the domestic or the exchange economy. In their minds, I think they were divided. The domestic economy was the one that produced food and housing and fuel and clothing for the family. And the best estimates are that around 50% of the entire American economy was consumed at home. It never went through a market. There was never a price. You just ate it or put it on. And then there is another economy where you're trying to exchange things in order to get things you can't make for yourself. When you grow grain, you have to take it to a miller. And so you have to have something with which you can repay the miller. And it may be working on his farm, helping him to fence or to hay or lending him a plow or an ox or something. And there are scores, scores of relationships that any farmer will have with someone else, something they've borrowed, something where they've gotten into debt because they uh, used a pasture for a while. And this exchange economy is all within the town or the nearby adjoining towns. It's not necessarily the Atlantic market. The Atlantic market 
in my opinion, except in the South where you have these big stable crops and in the middle colonies with wheat, it's relatively just a fraction of the total economy. Mostly it's the domestic make for yourself and the exchanges with neighbors for things that help you to get the things you want. Wow. As much as 50% of the early American economy could have been consumed in the domestic economy. And as we said, that's the economy where farmers grew and made things for their families to use. So when I think about farming, I think back to the books and lessons that spoke about subsistence farming or farming for a competency, which is the idea that farmers really tried to produce all of the goods that would meet their families' needs. But I noticed in your book, The American Farmer in the 18th Century, that we really need to think about this type of farming as self-provisioning. So would you tell us more about self-provisioning and why we really shouldn't think of it as subsistence or competency farming? Yeah, that's right. There is this language that we've used for so long to describe farming. And when we say subsistence farming, we not only mean that the farmers provided for themselves, but we mean that that was primarily what they did. Primarily, all they were able to muster was enough to get along on. So it implies you know, near poverty or a very restricted style of life. And then when you become a market farmer, then finally you're able to make a profit on the things that you grow. Because subsistence farmer points towards property, I use the word provisioning because every farmer, including the richest, the great planters in Virginia and the Carolinas, were self-provisioning. That is, they grew and made as much as they possibly could for themselves and for their slaves and their tenants and so on. So that is a basic of all farm life. And then on top of that, you do these things that allow you to purchase fish hooks or an axe or a book or rum or coffee or chocolate that you couldn't make for yourself. You know, our conversation thus far has really been focused on the farmer. And as I heard you describe self-provisioning, it occurred to me that farmers often work with their families on their farms. So would you talk to us about the role that families played on the early American farm? The family really is the core of it because really the primary aim is to sustain the family and to help it flourish. And that just doesn't mean keeping it barely alive, but being able to buy, you know, a nice piece of fabric for a dress or a cufflink, a teapot or some nice furniture. So that's really what it's about. The goal of farming really is to keep the family alive and to help it flourish. Farmers don't think of profit. When someone asks Thomas Jefferson, what's the return on your investment? He had no idea. He never calculated, never thought about it. He didn't know any farmers who did. Here, it was just to sort of make your life flourish. So there's that, the purpose of farming, but there's also the method of farming because everybody in the household becomes a worker. In New England, only workers in many cases were your children. So while children are kind of a, an expense and a burden when they're young, by the time they're 10 or 11, those girls are working a churn and uh, helping with the canning and the boys are out driving a wagon and uh, helping haul in logs and doing all sorts of things. So your family is your workforce. And after about age 14, it's a tremendous advantage to have those extra hands around the house. But then it becomes a heavy responsibility because the idea is that the parents will provide for their children to get a start, give them enough land to start a farm of their own in some way. And not all families could do that, but that was what they aimed for. So the sustenance of the family and the provision for the family and creating a future for the family, that defines the structure of farm life. That's the calendar and the schedule by which they work, by which they uh, plan their futures. And of course, their roles. I mean, what is a good wife or a good husband? A good husband is a good husbandman, one who can run a farm. And a wife is one who can 
keep her side of things going. So your family roles are really your work roles. And the father's authority is what sort of commands the workforce. He does it as a father as well as a boss. So everything is integrated into this farming structure. Richard, could you provide us with a bit more detail about the different roles of the farm family? I mean, what tasks would fall to the wife or woman of the farm and her female children versus, say, the tasks that would have been the purview of her good husbandmen and their male children? Well, people have talked about the gender geography of farming in that the woman mainly worked in the house and the father in the fields, and then they sort of overlap in the barn where the women would do the dairying, the milking, the cheese making, the butter making, and the husband would provide the hay for the animals. That's part of it. But the wife is in charge of all the preservation activities. Let me read you just a few lines from the book to give you an idea what was involved. Esther raised ducks. This is a woman living on Long Island, which they sold in New York. In fruit season, they dried cherries and sold some. For four days in November, they cut apples for drying. They harvested peaches, dried pears, kept bees, made pickles. After the hogs were slaughtered in the fall, sausage had to be made. So from season to season, there's just a whole host of tasks that fell upon them. And in this particular diary, the woman was just completely exhausted most of the time. The workload was so heavy. And she had slaves in the household to work with. So she's not just a mistress who stands above it all and issues commands. She's out laboring along with all the workers she has at her disposal. Well, I know we'd love to know more about the farmhands who would have been there to help out the farm families with their labor. But before we investigate farmhands, we know that mortality was a constant in early America. People died all the time. What happened to the family farm and the distribution of its labor when a wife or husband died? Well, it was a huge gaping hole created when anyone died, but especially the husband or the wife, because a wife managed that household. And if that preservation work, the cooking work, the tending of the kids had no one to look after them, it's a terrible gaping hole. Oftentimes, an older daughter would move back into the home. Or sometimes they just have to hire a serving girl to come in and take the part of the wife. So it's tough when either death or even sickness puts people out of action for a while. And there's an awful lot of sickness. People are always getting ill and going down for a while. And people then just have to adapt. Kinsmen would help out. You know, a cousin would send over her daughter to work in the house for a while. There's a lot of exchange of labor among families. And families usually is the route by which this labor is exchanged from one household to another. So in the case of death or a long illness, a family farm was still manned by a family. It might just have been augmented by extended family. So if a farmer, say, died, his widow might just have a cousin or a nephew come over and help plow her fields. Yeah, that's right. You've got neighbors to help out, but especially for the uh, things inside the house, especially if you needed to tend little babies, they would bring in or you would farm out your little baby to someone, your wife's sister, if your wife died, would take over and nurse the child. Now, you mentioned that farmers hired servants and purchased enslaved men and women to help them work their farms. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor... Albert would really like to ask a question about this. Those who wished to farm in early America had to acquire a lot of different knowledge, such as when and how to plant certain crops, what kinds of trades they should pick up so that they could best support their families and participate in their local economies, and who might need what tool or what kind of assistance from time to time. All of this knowledge helped farmers and farm families play active roles in their local communities, just like you play an active role in this community the community of Ben Franklin's World listeners. Each week, the team at the Omohundro Institute and I produce an episode because we know you love acquiring knowledge about the early American past and that you like to pass that knowledge on. Having a desire to acquire knowledge and to pass on that knowledge is part of what being a great community member is all about. And now, 
you'll be able to show the world that the Ben Franklin's World community is a community you're proud to be a part of. Because we have t-shirts. That's right. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash shop and you'll find a couple of great t-shirt designs. In each purchase, raises some funds to help the Omahundro Institute and I keep this podcast going. And if there are other items you'd like to see in our store, such as tote bags, ball hats, or mugs, perhaps even onesies, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, and the Omahundro Institute and I will do our best to stock the items that you want to display your Ben Franklin's World pride. So visit benfranklinsworld.com slash shop and order your Ben Franklin's World t-shirt today. Richard, Albert would like to know more about the roles indentured servants and enslaved people played on family farms. So what kinds of work would these free indentured and enslaved servants have performed? Well, in small households, they would almost be used like a family member, son or a daughter. There's a marvelous diary of a farmer in New London, Connecticut that I did a lot with. And uh, he purchased a slave when his sons were growing old and would not be around the house much longer. He purchased a slave, Adam Jackson, and he treated him like a member of the family. He'd send him off on long trips all by himself, carry grain or wool from one place or another, and uh, trust him out in the fields. So they develop uh, almost a familial relationship. Underneath it, of course, always is force. There's less whipping in these small households than there were on the big plantations, but the slaves were assimilated. They probably didn't sleep in the house. They'd probably sleep in the shed or in a barn. So they're not fully family members, but they're part of things. When we think about indentured servants, we may recall lessons that taught us that one of the ways to acquire a farm when you didn't have a lot of capital to invest in one was to become an indentured servant. Because after your terms of service, the master was often contractually obliged to grant you some land and farming implements. So Richard, did this granting of farms to indentured servants actually happen? Was this a legitimate way to actually acquire a farm? Well, it's a good question. Thinking of 17th century Virginia, where the indentured servitude was most prevalent, you know, they would recruit people in London and say, well, we'll give you your passage across the Atlantic in return for seven years of service, and they would promise them this or that. There are lots of complaints about farmers not meeting their obligations, but I think on the whole, it was a way to get started, especially in the early part of the 17th century. Some of the people who later became eminent planters were initially servants, so it was possible. I would say this, however, the way that you really got ahead in the South was to be granted land by the legislature, which you were to develop and as a part of opening the wilderness. And the idea would be that you would build roads into this land and begin to open it up, establish a little store, this or that, and other people could move in. So it was a way of settling the land. And those grants, you know, in the thousands of acres or at least the hundreds of acres, only went to the eminent. They wouldn't go to an indentured servant unless they performed some really remarkable service. So they're not on an even keel, but they were indentured servants. So yes, they went to the frontier and found property and uh, were able to get a start in life. Now, throughout our conversation, we've talked about examples of farmers and farming in New England, in New York, in the Mid-Atlantic, and in Virginia in the South. And one of the fascinating aspects about Richard's book, The American Farmer in the 18th Century, is that he has many chapters devoted to charting the differences between farming in these different regions. Richard, Mark is curious about regional variations in farming practices. So would you provide us with an overview of the different types of crops, labor systems, and day-to-day farm life within each of these North American regions? There really are differences. There is sort of the basic provisional economy that is the one for the household that is much alike, that is corn, maize, is the foundation of a lot of their foodstuffs. And then they would have apples and vegetables and fish. So that part of the economy remains the same, but 
when it comes to the staple crop, the crop that was sold, it varies immensely going from south to north. And what determines the crop that you raise and make your staple really is the climate. I place a lot of importance on the length of the growing season. That is the period between the last frost, when you can safely plant without having your little seedlings nipped in the bud, to the first frost in the fall, when whatever you have in the field is going to be, again, frozen and probably ruined. And that growing season in the south is 180 days, so six months or more. As you go farther south, it gets longer and longer. And above it, it's shorter. And that makes a lot of difference of what you can grow. It takes quite a long while for tobacco to mature. So you can't grow it if the growing season is too short. Moreover, it isn't just the length of time it takes it to mature, but the length of time it takes to plant it and harvest it. So you really need 180 days to put in a substantial crop of tobacco seedlings and let it grow, cultivate it, nurse it along, and then to harvest it at the end. And below the line where the 180-day growing season begins, you could do it. Above it, you really couldn't. You could grow small crops, but you didn't have enough time to really put in a substantial crop. And this means that most valuable crops are viable in the South. You could grow them and make a profit on them and not in the North. So the returns on your farming are just much less in New England. Farmers just aren't worth as much. They can't have as much buying power. And it increases as you go south until you finally get to the sugar islands with their immensely valuable crop. So that means things vary as you go up and down the coast. In the middle colonies, wheat is the great crop, and that's very valuable, or so as the 18th century goes on. And this means that you have a different labor system. You can't afford to buy slaves in New England. Your crops don't justify an expensive purchase and caring for the slaves all their lives. They're very costly. And so there are very few slaves, only in very particular situations. In the South, you can. So the labor systems change as you go up and down the coast. And I'll just mention one other, just to add to the story. In the South, the animals can forage in the woods for 10 or 11 months of the year. In the North, the grass stops growing in December and doesn't start again till March. So you lose three or four months. And that means in the North, you have to feed your animals for three or four months, which means you spend your whole summer haying. In the South, your animals can forage most of the year and in a pinch can sort of work their way through the one month where grass does start growing. They get very skinny, but they can make it through. So the whole year in the north is dominated by the haying season, which is critical. Keep your animals alive. In the south, you're free to do other things, to grow tobacco or grow rice or whatever you want. So southern farming is just much more prosperous. The returns on your labors are much greater because of these advantages. So it really is the growing season that helped determine the profitability of an early American farm and the crops it could grow. So that's why we can explain why Connecticut farmers sometimes grew tobacco, but why you never see a big tobacco plantation in Connecticut. Right. It was very expensive to grow because you had to bring in a lot of labor to get it all in the ground in time. So only when the price goes way up can uh, you profitably grow tobacco in Connecticut. Does the growing season also account for why, when we talk about farming in the 18th century and really into the 19th century, that we talk about plantations from Maryland South and farms from Pennsylvania North? Yes, it really is, I think, because the returns on your investment were so great that it justified the capital investment to really make a kind of a little business out of planting. The big thing, going back to our earlier question, is you can buy those slaves to clear the land. So you can actually use 5,000 acres or 
substantial portion of it if you could get your hands on the land because you get the slaves in there clearing it up. You also mentioned that there was a lifestyle that Southern agriculture could support that Northern agriculture could not. And that one aspect of that lifestyle that Southern planters could afford was to hire or purchase more labor to work their fields. And I wonder, what are some of the other aspects of this Southern agricultural lifestyle that differed from the Northern agricultural lifestyle? The Southern planters could choose different models for a life. They could look to England, to the country gentleman, which in the 18th century is really the zenith of life, to have a large estate based on agriculture with many workers, a grand mansion, elegant accoutrements in your house and about your person. That was available, at least on a modest basis, in the South, when only a few rich merchants in the North, it's a much reduced style of life in the North. They tried, and a few families managed in the most fertile and prosperous areas of the North, but nothing like they were able to do in the South. Now, another aspect of farming I really think we need to investigate here is the role that farming played in Americans' Western push into the North American continent, especially since after the American Revolution, Americans moved West in really sizable numbers. So Richard, what role did farmers and farming play in Americans' desire to push West into the continent? Yeah, I've talked about family and farms and how the family provider, the workforce, and their roles were determined by their place in the farm operations. But family is really part of the life plan, not just the life schedule of farm families, because farmers all hoped that they could provide for the children the way parents do today. They want them all to go to school and go to college and get a start in life with a, some kind of good work. In those days, the idea is we want to set them up on the farm, and all the parents' accumulations will go to the children eventually, but they try to get them started along the way. And that means if you have families of five or six children, which were not uncommon in those days, you can just imagine you know, hundreds of thousands of little families trying to figure out where am I going to get land for my kids? How can they get started in life? So all those sort of biological familial drives to care for your children result in this huge expansion into the interior. You know, until the mid-19th century, there really seemed to be more Americans who farmed than who worked in any other occupation. So I wonder, what impact do you think has this history of farming and has the farming mentality had on present-day American identity. It's true. There were people opening up new farms right up till 1900. You know, the number of farms doubles in the last third of the 19th century. And that becomes the most secure form of life that many people can imagine. Cities are so insecure, you know, jobs come and go, but farms always provide food. So you can stay alive even if you're suffering in many ways. But it's not just, I think, in terms of character, it's not just that I'm a farmer. It's the mentality that I have to provide for myself. I have to make things of my own. That mentality has been part of us, that we can be independent. It still goes on in the belief men have that they should repair their own cars or change the oil, at least in my father's generation, I guess it's changing now, but my mother would can peaches. Well, it's not efficient to can peaches, but it was something she felt she had to do. There was something wholesome and right about preparing for yourself. So there's that kind of do-it-yourself mentality that represents the desire to be independent, to be able to support yourself, that I think is very deep in the American character. Now it's time for the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your 
opinion, what might have happened if slavery had not been adopted? How would the absence of slaves have impacted the work habits of early American farmers and regional farming variations? There would have been other forms of bound labor or purchase labor that would take their place. In the uh, 17th century, most of the work done on the tobacco farms in the South was indentured servants. And really, it's only because the supply of indentured servants dried up that Southern farmers were forced to sort of turn to slavery. There are other advantages of it. They were happy to be able to buy slaves. But uh, they'd gotten along very well with indentured servants. And after slavery ended, they get by with various kinds of labor and tenant farming. England does not have slaves. They're not slave labor on the farms. It's all done with tenant farming. Washington, at one point, at the end of his life, wanted to sell all his slaves and bring in tenant farmers to Mount Vernon. So he felt the miseries of slavery and really would have preferred another system. So they would have found a way. I think it would have changed the mentality to some extent. The presence of slaves really creates the mindset of a master class, the right to command, to rule, and almost with absolute authority. And that's a very disastrous form of thinking, very dangerous for everybody involved. And we might have had less of that in the South if slavery had not found its way to America. So in the preface to The American Farmer in the 18th Century, you note that this book took you decades to complete. So I wonder, now that you've finished and published your book, do you have a new project that you're working on? Well, I'm interested in lots of things. Along the way, while I was writing the book about farming, I wrote a biography of Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. And part of the story he told was that he came across a set of gold plates on which was written the text of the Book of Mormon, which he translated. And these gold plates have sort of entered into the American imagination in this sort of ingenious ways to have a place in Angels in America, Tony Kushner's Pulitzer Prize-winning play, and many other novels and books. So I'm sort of interested in this luminous religious object, you know, with its mystery and its promise of sacred knowledge. So that's my goal right now, to uh, look at all the forms that the gold plates have taken in American thinking. Do you have a preferred way that we can contact you if we have more questions about farming in early America? Well, I would be uh, happy to uh, answer questions if someone wants to write me an email. My uh, address is rlb7 at columbia.edu. And I'd be happy to hear from you. Richard Bushman, thank you so much for joining us and for helping us better understand the early American world of farms and farm families. It's been my pleasure. Farms and farming played a really big role in our early American past. Nearly three quarters of Euro-American colonists and settlers considered themselves to be farmers. Even those who plied trades as their primary occupation still sought to have enough land where they could keep a few animals, fruit trees, and a kitchen garden. As Richard related, this was because of the way the early American economy worked. Cities and towns had stores, but shopping for the food your family needed in those stores would have likely placed you on the debt rolls of the local storekeeper. Early America wasn't a place with a lot of cash, so farmers often had to trade or exchange goods and services for what they needed. So farming was seen as a smart economic practice, which is why most Americans sought to farm, even if it was on just a few acres. Now, what farmers farmed, the plants and animals that they sought to raise, varied by climate and region. As Richard revealed, most farmers grew corn, but those in the north also had to grow a lot of hay so that they could feed their animals over the winter. Plus, those who farmed in the north could rarely achieve the scale of agriculture that their counterparts in the south could. For example, it was totally possible to grow tobacco in New England. Connecticut farmers often grew a small crop of tobacco to suit their family's needs. But the growing season in Connecticut proved too short to grow tobacco on the same scale as a farmer or planter in Maryland, Virginia, or North Carolina. And because of that, Connecticut farms typically didn't have the same access to labor that a planter in the Chesapeake might have. Of course, neither did most new farmers in Western territories. 
Farmers often pushed west when they needed to find new lands to support their families. Now, in an effort to farm new soils on abundant and cheaper lands, families pushed west and sometimes set about the same arduous work of clearing their land to farm that those who had colonized the Atlantic coast had during the colonial period. They girdled trees, burned the stumps, and fenced in their cleared lands, all so the family could plant on 10 or 15 fertile acres. This practice of clearing land to make way for farm fields took place over generations. And when they weren't farming and clearing fields, farmers produced in other ways. Matthew Patton trapped furs and practiced carpentry. Some farmers, like the one Richard found in Connecticut, built boats. While others acquired skills and practiced trades in other areas, also they could keep busy and provide for their families. As Richard revealed, the goal of the farm family was to provision itself in ways that also allowed for the occasional purchase of a nice piece of cloth, a new pair of shoes, or some other desired luxury item like a tea set. It was rarely the goal of a farm family to just scrape by. Farm families worked really hard, and they worked to be independent. It's thanks to the American farm family that Americans today have a do-it-yourself mentality. Even when we have lots of stores to choose from and a plentiful supply of currency circulating through our economy, we still look to provision and do for ourselves, even when it doesn't always make economic sense to do so. You can find more information about Richard, his book, The American Farmer in the 18th Century, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. benfranklinsworld.com slash two, three, four. Don't forget that you can now display your Ben Franklin's World Pride because we have t-shirts. Take a look at our first designs by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash shop. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what more would you like to know about everyday life in early America? I know this is one of your favorite questions to pose to me and to explore. So what else would you like to know so I can see about covering it in a future episode? Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.